Thank you, Lauren. Uh, I was happy at Mountain View 10 years ago to do a talk on microtrends. Now I'm up to squared, hopefully 10 years from now, microtrends cubed. Many of you will be here, perhaps. Uh, so uh, this is a, a, you know, a book 10 years later that, that I kind of look at the world and figure out you know, how data drives me to trends and what are some of the implications, and how technology and demographics are coming together to create a lot of those trends. Now, 10 years earlier, I was just hugely optimistic about the future of technology. And 10 years later, I am hugely optimistic about the future of technology, but I think there's more of a but in it, and I, and I think I point out some of my concerns and pitfalls as technology goes to the next level in, in people's lives. Um, let me give you the theory of the case of microtrends. What is a microtrend? Small, under the radar trends that can have enormous effects or that just give you a, a, a kind of a shaped view of society and how it's developing. Think of the world as a, as a pointillist or as an impressionist painting and that you really kind of understand some of the dots. And then there's so many disruptions going on in society that people don't understand. Part of the reason they don't understand it is that underneath the surface, there are trends and counter trends going in exactly the opposite direction. That society isn't really going in one direction. It's going in a multitude of directions at once. And yet together, they then represent a picture of what's happening. Look, elections were won or lost on the basis of say 74,000 votes, old economy voters, uh, DACA recipients are less than a million people, but they're a huge basis of a political movement. Uh, you know, a best-selling book, it doesn't really have to sell if I got up to 1%. Uh, I, would, I would be a, an enormous author. In fact, microtrends really are critically important. And so I, I give you 50 in the book. Uh, I, devote, I, you know, I start with romance and sex because I hope it'll get you reading the rest of the book. Uh, <clears throat> but uh, it, it, it's as much, you know, are there 500 or 5,000? There could be. I think you will both get some insight into how I see the areas. I try to be generally counterintuitive. I try to do some things that you might not see. You know, I, I was tremendously, uh, you know, worked for Hillary Clinton, tried very hard to get the first woman president, but I write a little bit more in the book about guys left behind because, you know, it's the kind of book it is. I try to write about the things you're not necessarily reading about uh, every day. And I'll give you kind of an overview of some of the reasons behind the development of microtrends 10 years later. First, when we go back to economic development, and let's go back to the beginning of the 20th, 20th century, when Henry Ford said, you can have any color of car you want as long as it's black. And what the Ford economy was about was about standardization of the manufacture of goods so that everybody could have goods like a car, right? And they envisioned that the way the world would be clothed, housed, uh, fed, uh, and have products would be through this level of standardization. That was the idea. But that's not what it turned out. People, in fact, love choice, love to be different. And <clears throat> not so long ago, I think we evolved to what I call the Starbucks economy. Take a basic commodity, like coffee, any color you want as long as it's black, uh, and instead now create 155 different varieties of a simple commodity and give people a world of choice. Now in that case, uh, in, in that case, really, the barista does the work. Starbucks does the work for you. In most tech platforms, if you think of the original iPod, the iPod was any color you want as long as it's white for a long time. Uh, and you did the work making the soundtrack. Today, there's a third choice, AI, like a Pandora, that actually does the work. But the goal's the same, to basically produce customized products that drive the marketplace. Today, as I say, we are actually advanced to the Uber economy. And what do I mean by that? <clears throat> Uber has to, in an instant, provide you with a service slash its product that can take you from any point to any point 
It is a totally customized, individualized product. And so the name of the game has gone in microtrends from these clusters down to the, down to the individual. Hold that thought. Now we have the, what I'd say, one of the counterintuitive properties of more choice. I like to illustrate it with a restaurant. So suppose we had a restaurant that just served chicken or fish. Okay. Eh, who really cares that much about the choices? Chicken or fish every day. Uh, now let's add steak and sushi. Well, now we get some real passion. The steak eaters love Kansas City strips. Sushi eaters love Toro. They really burrow into their choices. And so every day, they don't actually get chicken or fish anymore. They get their own choice over and over again because they love it so much because we've done such an incredible job. And then, you know, just to boot, the sushi people say, wow, those meat eaters, they're really, oh, can you believe it? That just kills you. Right? And the media starts to say, can you believe over there they're eating raw fish? Right? I mean, that'll just give you, you know, E. coli in a minute. So they begin not only to love their choice, but they begin to get antagonistic towards the other choices. All right, now think Fox News and MSNBC. Okay? Understand that by giving people more choice, they stop making choices, they burrow into their choices. And we get exactly the opposite result of what we intended, which was to have a world of freedom and choice, people experimenting. And then you fast forward 10 years later when they go into Starbucks, what do people ask for? The regular. They've stopped making choices. And so this is a problem. It's a problem of, the, of, of us being so good at providing choices. Now, another major thought in the book. For every trend, there is a counter trend. I call it the Newtonian, my Newtonian law of trends. Now, the difference between me and Newton is that in Newton, every trend had to have an opposite and equal reaction. These do not have to be opposite and equal. At any time, the trend or the counter trend can be bigger or smaller. Right? The trend for sushi can, be, can have a trend for steak. The trend towards technology on the train can have the quiet car. Right? <clears throat> it doesn't have to be the same size, but oftentimes there's a battle or shifting. And in fact, the cover of the book is, as you look at it, it's a Newton's cradle in an impossible position because in the, in the Newtonian theory of trends here, uh, these trends can ebb and flow. So what are some major trends and counter trends today? Everybody knows we're in the age of information. At the very same time, of course, we are in the age of misinformation. Never before has there been so much discussion about false information. Millennials, wow, can't stop talking about how important they are. There are now more nanogenarians than ever, as we'll come back to. Smartphones, sure, everybody has some. They just had an uptick last year in flip phone manufacturing to two million a year. Every trend, there's a counter trend. Silicon Valley versus the old economy and the old economy voters, I think that's probably the biggest conflict of the last couple of years is those Silicon Valley voters, voters on the coast who did very well with the rise of technology, were pitted in a battle against the old economy voters who were losing more and more as manufacturing jobs shrunk from 20 million when I left working with President Clinton to about 11 million. Uh, and Two others, egghead policies versus common sense policies. Think things like climate change versus, hey, Iran's our enemy, bop them. You know what I mean? A much more simpler view of policy. And educated, we have never been more educated. And I have a chapter on what I call the impression of elites. Never before have so many educated people made so many conclusions that they believe in on so little evidence. In fact, it turns out the more educated you are, the more spinnable you are, and I happened to run for a while a large company called Burson Marsteller that was dedicated <laughs> to that very proposition. So those are some of the flows and ebbs and counter forces. And how do you apply this to the election? What, was, what are some trends and counter trends? Well, as I said to you before, old economy voters felt neglected. Uh, if you look at it, the voters, the 60x million uh, voters for Donald Trump 
lived in communities that got a third of the GDP, and these 60 odd million voters for Hillary Clinton lived in communities that got two thirds of the GDP. Well, the voters with one third said, where's my half, okay? And they stood up and exercised their democratic power. And they, were, they, they had economic grievances, and they also, as primarily more older, more rural-based voters, had a huge cultural gap between millennial voters, particularly when it came to family and religion. Society, as I said to you, is divided more and more into niches that then see each other less and less. And in fact, we have about the same number of conservatives and about the same number of liberals, but we have more very liberals, more very conservative uh, voters. And those impressionable elites, when they believe something, boy, they all believe it. <laughs> so the New York Times said that it was 93 to 7, Hillary was going to win. They were in their own environment, the impressionable elites, the kind of election analysis. Look, how could billions and billions of dollars have been spent on this election problem, who's going to win by how much, in the Electoral College? And not a single person in the universe posted an accurate memo. The most accurate person is actually Kellyanne Conway, who goes on TV, almost exactly predicts the Electoral College, and is laughed at during the entire interview. <laughs> so uh, a couple of other things floating around, changes in lifestyle. Very powerfully, people typically had a high school sweetheart, got married pretty quickly, didn't go to college. Now people go to college, men and women are in the workforce, Child rearing and marriage have been pushed back, and there's a good 10 or 15 years that a lot of people have on their own, right? And that is a whole new space in life that just didn't exist, and I'll come back to that. Seniors, on the other hand, have the same thing in this kind of accordioning of life, where they have more years now than they ever had. They have a pretty good chance, if you make it to 65, to make it to 80 or 90. They're living longer, they have more money than ever before, they're doing more dating than ever before, they're having more fun. Right? And of course, we've had a huge migration from the rural areas to the cities. And as you guys know, tech data is the new gold, AI bots are coming, big data is here, and I only have some really grainy picture of my grandparents, but today the data on you could start as early as the womb, and the incredible data file that you have for your entire life is, is unlike anything the world has ever had before. So I take those as backdrops to kind of think in your head of what, what actually some of the bigger trends are. And now let's get really small, okay? How do you apply kind of what we learn to what's going on? How do you generate a trend? I was responsible for what became called soccer bombs, you know, back uh, in the 90s. And when you find a trend, you then find people who may be interested in identifying themselves as part of that trend. There may be marketing implications. There may be uh, implications for public policy. So I'm gonna go pretty quickly through a bunch. There are 50 in the book. Graying bachelors, I told you I like to start out with a little dating. There are, in fact, 62 unmarried men per 100 unmarried men if, you're, if you make it to 64 or 65, giving these guys the best odds of their life. Uh, and considering they have a little more money, uh, they, can, they can buy some hair stuff, uh, <laughs> they are living the life now that they, that they never lived. And of course, uh, flip side, STDs among seniors on the rise. So single with pets. I'm going to skip back and forth between the generations a little bit. I call them SWPs, all right, push back marriage and child rearing. Well, sometimes that house seems a little empty, that apartment, get a pet, okay? In fact, seven in 10 millennials own pets. Now, when a millennial gets a pet, and they're working, and they don't yet have a whole family, take care of that pet. That means dog walking industry. That means GMO-based food, <laughs> you know, no GMO food. It means some really pampered pooches here. So that's a couple of billion dollars down to the bottom line of the pet industry. And the problem being that when that first child or marriage, if and when it does come along, wow, okay, that pooch was number one, is now way down in the basement. Germs, don't go near my child. Uh, that requires the need for a lot of pet psychologists. So there are ramifications for the simplest things. 
Nonagenarians, okay, there are, you know, more people over 90. The 90 population, look, if you're, if you're getting those like birthday presents from your grandparents, wow, there are more grandparents you're living longer than ever before. Uh, population has quadrupled from 720,000 to two and a half million. Uh, another 25 years could go to about eight million nanogenarians. Now that means that the number one new job being created is not data scientists at Google, it is home health aid. Right? And there is not actually enough home health aides to go around to deal with the crisis. So then that creates a robot, robotic opportunity if you can create somebody who can, who, if you can create, I shouldn't say somebody because I'll come back to that, but if you can create, in fact, a robot that can fulfill a lot of the needed, uh, needed functions, it certainly is going to be a needed area. Uh, here's, flipping back, here's my footloose and fancy free. What does it mean when you've got 10 or 15 years on your own? It means, hey, revitalization of the cities. What happened to housing costs and houses? Who needs them? Get a bunch of roommates. Split the cost. You used to come in for the rental office with roommates, and they'd say, oh, we don't do that here. Here they say, how many roommates you got now? Right? You used to say, uh, I want a one-year lease. They'd laugh at you. I want two or three. No, they don't even give you more than a one-year lease. Right? So in fact, the whole roommate lifestyle you know, it fuels a lot of the, you know, take out, uh, take out food. And of course, it fuels dating sites and dating society. And it also means that if I've got 10 or 15 years on my own, and then I should get married, well, I'm a little set in my ways. Like, turn that TV off now, okay? Turn out the lights. People are not as flexible. So actually, more married couples than ever before are building houses with separate bedrooms. So cancer survivors, I talk in the book a little bit about some of my own experience, uh, but I note that, in fact, there are now, thanks to the good developments in, in healthcare, uh, lifestyle, and aging, uh, more and more cancer survivors, really 15 million cancer survivors, you know, living in America. You guys behind the search engines know that the very first thing you do when you get a, a diagnosis is you Google search it for sure. Right, and so we could pick out virtually anybody who's really uh, in, involved in the disease pretty quickly or has, has relatives. But the truth of the matter is nobody, uh, nobody really does anything afterward, right? The medications, the radiation uh, has really serious consequences for millions and millions of people. And then as soon as they drop out of the emergency system, there's almost nothing in terms of help or assistance. So part of microtrends is finding either groups that could use some, some assistance or brewing social problems. So kids on meds, sure there are none here, uh, but in fact 15% of America's children, over 11 million kids, have been diagnosed with ADHD. That's up from just 2 million in 1978. Now there was population growth, but it wouldn't, wouldn't account for that. Now, remember at the same time, healthcare became much more available and health insurance became much more available. So what was usually the province of rich kids in private schools to have these kinds of meds really good went through the system. Now, uh, is this a good thing or a bad thing? We don't know. Mostly, it's mostly boys who wind up with the diagnosis. And in order to get through school, and which requires an awful lot of sitting still these days, these medications help a lot of kids who might otherwise not be able to make it. But do we know the long-term effects of this? Do we know whether it creates another opioid-type crisis? Do we know what to do with the medications later on? 80% of those with a diagnosis get medication. This is an example <coughs> of, of something that's brewing, and that if we don't give attention to it, we'll have a lot of social problems that we didn't notice. And that's what are the, some of the benefits of, of microtrends and spotting them early. Uh, bots with benefits. I spent a fair amount of time uh, in the book talking about just some of the technology developments that I pick out. And look, I call it relationship with a bot, right? <clears throat> Microsoft uh, had a really interesting bot that they that the people in China made that whose sole purpose was to have a conversation and kind of engage people. And then they took it to America, and within a day, it started to have racist conversations, so they had to, they had to get rid of it. But, but, you know, my biggest concern about bots and relationships with bots is, 
is that I always ask people, is Alexa a he or a she, right? So is Alexa a he or a she? Anybody want to give me? She, right. So no, Alexa isn't it, right? And if you read through the material of the companies, Apple, Google, I'm sure if I read through the Google, it's very careful never to call a collection of code a he or a she. Now, then I asked Alexa the other day, are you a he or a she? Alexa said, I am in female character. What a slimy answer, <laughs> okay? Alexa didn't admit that Alexa isn't it. It hid that fact from you. So, you know, I, I have a thing that, look, a lot of technology starts out like this. There's a bot that tells you the weather. It says, you know, Mark, it's gonna rain. You might take your raincoat with you, give a little more time to get to work. Great, thank you very much, uh, bot. Now, back at headquarters, somebody says, we're helping out Mark and like 50 million other people, and what do we get for it? Nothing. So somebody says, why don't we make a deal with the umbrella company? I say, okay, great. We'll make a deal with the umbrella company, and now it says, hey, Mark, it's gonna rain, and by the way, you can get an umbrella right down the corner, right? Perfect, win-win, you now have a good business model for telling me all this stuff, world is good. Now, somebody says, earnings are coming. We're not really getting enough money for the, you know, the Wall Street. What do we do? Somebody says, you know that algorithm that says you the weather might rain? Well, it's right now we set it at 50%. Let's set it to 40%. Let's warn Mark when it's 40 or 35%. Mark would no, won't know the difference, but he'll probably buy a few more umbrellas. <laughs> now, who is the bot working for? It started out working for me. Now the bot is primarily a salesperson. And I see a lot of technology, agnostic to any company, that gets driven from that. And the problem is the consumer has no idea. The consumer doesn't know that there's a, a relationship here and that it's changed from being for me. And one of the things in the book I say, we gotta have disclosure about who or what is driving the algorithms behind the bot. Is it working for me? Maybe I have to pay 20 bucks a month to get it to work for me. Or is it working for advertisers? So I hope you enjoy those chapters. Technology advanced people, I don't understand why there isn't more investment in this area. I did a poll, <clears throat> and you know, healthcare is geared towards uh, getting you back to human standard. The truth is, your dog has better hearing than you. So why can't you have hearing as good as your dog through some technology device? Well, I don't know. I don't understand why so much is put into driverless cars, which I, I think is a huge technological lift, and so little actually is put into human enhancing products of all the senses, when we know that the animal kingdom ha can, is better than all the senses. We know the technology exists because we could see it, right? And I I'm, I'm actually don't understand why so little investment in products is in this area. It's what I do. As chief strategy officer of Microsoft, I used to evaluate hundreds of you know, ideas for products, and I, I wonder why there isn't more investment in that area. So a couple of fun ones, Uptown Stoners, it's gonna be a huge potential marijuana market. Uh, I say, look, focus on the upscale customers, the rest of it's gonna be commoditized. Restaurants, spas, vacations, well, you know, it's a $200 billion liquor industry, it's a $7 billion marijuana industry. There's a lot of money going, going into that right now. So you can find some business ideas in microtrends. The Koreans sure did. They, they it was really phenomenal how Koreans find trends, like the idea that they took of the glass skin and turned that into a $13 billion US marketplace. It's absolutely incredible how they can pick up on a small trend and turn that into, turn that into gold. Pro-proteiners, we all know the government said a number of years ago, eat more carbohydrates. Then the government turned out, ah, shockingly, to be wrong. Uh, and then they said, a lot of people came along and said, eat more protein. So I went to investigate what protein was the winner. I, of course, thought it was sushi, but you know that turned out to be, uh, you can only buy sushi in restaurants. Uh, and in fact, Americans eat very little fish. The winner was chicken. Chicken became actually the protein of compromise. And if you take a look at what happened, you take a little trend, like the change in the recommendation for protein versus carbohydrates, chicken consumption went from 20 pounds a year 
to 90 pounds, right? And that's an incredible growth of what you think of as a simple commodity industry. I immediately bought more chicken stock uh, after doing the research on the chapter. Uh, old economy voters, as I said before, uh, you know, really those folks who lived, you know, the half of the country that lived in a third of the GDP got really angry uh, about the, the other half of the country that lives in those places with two-thirds of the GDP, and they said, where's my half, okay? Because their half has disappeared. And this created social problems under the radar screen that we really didn't see. Uh, and I thought, actually, during the Clinton administration that, that I worked with, we had stabilized manufacturing jobs. I was really surprised to find how they had fallen in half uh, in, under the last two presidencies without any attention. It's, this is a great example of how what is a microtrend turns out to be so powerful a number of years later, particularly when it's neglected early on. Another problem in the, in the system is what I call couch potato voters. So with couch potato voters, 90 million Americans are eligible to vote, but don't vote. It's too many. Why is it too many? Uh, it's too many because it now encourages campaigns to use really uh, tough and excited, you know, tough and uh, uh, divisive messages to try to get a slice of their potato to turn out more than somebody else's slice. And when I ran campaigns that went for swing voters, then typically I would be trying to pitch to the other side, and after I won, the country would be unified, because I spent two years trying to get people who didn't agree with me to agree with me. If I spend two years just trying to get a slice off the, off the couch, I am probably, in fact, dividing society, and then we wind up with a more divided society. If we could have registration at birth, for example, I, I suggest voting at ATM machines. Uh, it's a secure network distributed throughout the country. Uh, I, I think we could do a lot of things. And the couch, by the way, will surprise you. It, it's mostly downscale, uneducated white voters who are on the couch. Uh, and, and so, but we've got to solve that problem. It will actually make for much more uni unification. Then, uh, for those of you, most of you here won't really recall Hazel, but she was the housekeeper that really ran everything, the, the archetype. Uh, of that, and, and what I kind of make out is that today, uh, today people typically don't have one housekeeper, but what they have is 10 different people led into their lives. Their, <laughs> let's, you know, we could, we could start with their yoga instructor, their trainer, their uh, dog walker, the manicurist, the, the hairdresser or barber. And, and so really now, actually, they have a flood of service people Right, who make up, who really do know intimate details of your life. And in fact, we've gone from a 40% service economy to a 56% service economy. And when people get more money today, they don't necessarily say, I want another car. In fact, they don't even have a driver's license, many of them. So what they really say is, I want another service. I want another massage. I want another, you know, something that really pleases me personally. And that is a tremendous trend, both in terms of creating an enormous personal service industry uh, and, in, and in, I think, creating jobs. So having given you a flavor of microtrends, I hope you will read the other 37 and make up your own. Uh, I'll just close with, kind of, I, I conclude with a few things. Uh, I, look, I, I have all, you know, I go back to uh, when I started my polling company, I uh, built a computer and a kit, programmed an assembler overnight and had overnight polling. Right? So nobody's more enthusiastic about technology than, than I was. Uh, and we are at the next wave of personalization. Jobs are evolving in the service sector. It's making luxury. I have a number of chapters about how you know, those things that you know, Bill Gates once built a, you know, an enormous house as the world's richest person. And he had, get this, a touch screen in every room, right? <laughs> so, so luxury for less is a big trend. Basic technology is becoming almost universal. And life is driven by choices that are more satisfying. And 10 years ago, that would have been my list. <laughs> but today, you know, big tech is becoming super powerful. You have to acknowledge that. AI, without proper Rules of disclosure, I think, can be easily abused and, and could lead to some very traumatic 
uh, uh, kinds of relationships, uh, the likes of which we don't even really understand. Big data does strip people of privacy. Maybe they agree to it, maybe not. Society is becoming more balkanized. And something I didn't go into in the talk uh, is that actually, as more and more people have this 10 or 15 years, and as more and more people have successful careers, the first thing they get rid of is children. <laughs> Population growth is in almost all the developing countries is, uh, is, is, is sinking. So policy changes, you know, I, I recommend some changes in antitrust laws because they don't quite fit emerging situations. We really have to be better about the benefits of the new economy to every region. We have to be better about disclosure of algorithms. And, and I recommend, look, I, I worked with a lot of engineers, and engineers just want to put something really great and new into our society, but we don't often study, uh, often enough study the implications that come out of that. We have to give people more control over their data. We have to break the cocooning somehow, forcing people to see new choices that maybe they're closing out. And I, I do a big thing in the book about news, that I do think news really needs, that, that I don't, the tech companies should be in the platform business, but I worry when they actually sort out the rankings of the stories and crowdsourcing the truth, while we still believe that the earth was flat if we went to a model like that. Uh, and I have a number of things about making democracy more open and reducing the size of that couch without requiring everybody to, to vote. Uh, and I think finally, I, I kind of say that to take advantage, uh, particularly for business people, uh, data is king. What I, what I explain is, look, if I have two companies and one has a real data set of its customers and the other doesn't, well, <clears throat> on the one hand, the other company that doesn't, doesn't have all that data scientist costs and whatnot, but they have a higher cost of marketing. The company that has a data set and understands its customers in the modern world can market to their customers less expensively. They have a fundamental competitive advantage. They will drive the other company out of business. It is just a matter of time. So for every business that doesn't understand this, they need a simple primer. Think services in today's economy as much as products. For every marketplace and for every trend, there is a counter marketplace, there is a counter trend. You just have to think of it. And these everyday micro trends create new opportunities. If you read the book, you'll find out how women are the big new purchasers of guns, whether it's beauty products from Koreas or apartments that are set up for roommates. So I hope you enjoy the book. Uh, in reading it as much as I did, find yourself in the book or find some interesting trends or become a microtrender yourself. Thank you very much. Given all your expertise in polling, why specifically were all the polls, or a lot of the polls rather, so wrong, so inaccurate? You know, what happened there? Uh, a good question. I get that often. And, and let me say that I don't actually think the polls, quote unquote, were wrong. I think the level of analysis of the polls was, was hugely unsophisticated. Uh, a poll is not something that just anybody can read. Behind the poll is a theory, a hypothesis, an uh, understanding of elections, voting groups, uh, history, right? And when I did this polling, say, with President Clinton, and I had to call it, I had polls in 26 states up until the last day. I had a model of the prob probable vote from each and every state. I had a model of the Electoral College. And I had national polls on top of that. And all of these things had to reconcile so that I had to tell the president on the way back uh, from South Dakota at 2 AM that I thought, because Ralph Nader was going to get some additional votes in California, that he'd be below 50. And we hit it 49, 41 on the dot. And there were polls out there as much as 17. Who said it was 17? Now, you fast forward to today. The, cam the campaign cut back on its polling. They didn't see the alternative universe. I always say that polling is not about seeing those things that you already know. You don't need polling for that. You already know it. It's about seeing those things you don't know. So you're always spending most of your time studying the 20% that is due and unfamiliar to you because, and I think they stopped doing that. Uh, I think there were telltale polls in Ohio and Iowa that were almost double digit. 
<clears throat> and so you needed an explanation for the fact that, wow, Donald Trump was doing better in Republican states, but, doing, but getting killed by double digits in a bellwether of Ohio. And you had to reconcile those facts, and nobody did, because <laughs> they were both true. And that's exactly what microtrends is. There's one trend that he was doing better among Latinos that had grown in, in numbers and in turnout in some of these states, except the Cuban vote, which turned out to be, again, another microtrend that was missed, right? And then the old economy voters going the other direction, balancing each other out, creating polls that were close and that were actually creating an electoral college nightmare. Now, <clears throat> I, if I'd had the resources, I'd like to think that I would have picked that up. But these campaigns now had billions of dollars of resources, and neither campaign, uh, look, with the campaign, when you're in the surprise upset, it's a surprise upset. <laughs> so that, hap that comes together, actually, in the last moment. But you still see it rising, because Donald Trump and Barack Obama that I battled in 2000, they were phenomenon. And phenomenon hockey, phenomenons hockey stick up. If you don't stop them here, trust me, you don't stop them here, right? So I hope you'll. My basic point is I thought the analysis was unsophisticated and that analysis has to take all of the various elements that you see, reconcile all of them, and then come out with intelligent judgment. And people got smarter, they got lazy, they got to believe that, hey, anybody could do a poll and, and read it, and it's just not the case. Thanks. Appreciate it. I hope that gives you good. <laughs> Uh, you were talking about getting uh, getting the people off the couch, and uh, one of the things I'm curious about is that uh, voting laws uh, vary a lot by state. So, um, if there's uh, some states that are have some promising or, or have had good initiatives for getting people off the couch by changing their laws, or if maybe it's uh, beyond just the policy front and just other other ways that you can get people off the couch that you could talk to? Uh, yeah, I mean, look, I think, I think vote by mail really has gotten a lot of people off the couch. And in some of those states, they do get uh, a fundamentally higher turnout. Uh, I, I tend to worry about methods that, that break down the secret ballot. So I, I don't, I, you know, the reason I said was suggested like ATM voting is that one of the critical components of voting, and I do have a, a chapter on closet conservatives, is that people that no one else, you know, see your ballot. And in, in a lot of these mail and other things, people can say, I want to see your ballot or your, uh, and, and so I get a little worried about that. So what do I want? I want a universally easy, private voting system that can't be hacked. So you've got to meet all those criteria on the one hand, right, and then a secure, and then on the other hand, uh, I don't want just to encourage certain groups to vote. Because that it really is what creates these divisive campaigns. I want to be neutral in terms of getting people off the couch. And that means not just registering people in cities. It means registering people both in cities and rural areas, which is why I'd register people at birth. There's no reason we shouldn't have a national voter registry uh, anymore. The government already knows where to find you. Uh, I don't think that that would be calamitous. And it will avoid a lot of the, 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 law, the legal problems with who can vote. You alluded to the Uber economy, and I know personally my life has been changed by the sharing economy, everything from how to get around to how to dress. Do you think it's a trend or here to stay, the sharing economy? No, I, look, I think both the sharing economy and to me the, the Uber economy is about you know, really understanding what your needs are and being able to deliver very precisely uh, against those needs uh, in, in a way that, look, even uh, uh, my son has an app uh, which I, I disclose, that it's my son, uh, but he has an app called M. Taylor that, uh, that takes your measurements and then delivers you custom clothes. So in the past, you didn't have something that you could buy for $69 that was custom clothes. You could buy it for $150, $250, $400. So what I really think is the cost of personalization through technology and through the digital, you know, we always used to think of digital layers. Every service or every product area or piece of the economy will have a digital layer, right? And that digital layer then has ramifications. Most of the time, it makes the ability to really personalize and customize things cheaper. And that is what enables you to have, you have it your way in virtually everything of life. And I think that is the critical trend if I were opening a business today that I'd want to meet. Um, do you have an explanation for why 
people initially want lots of choices, but then uh, sort of coalesce on sh fewer choices? Well, I, I, I think, I think. see, this is a thing. They want more choices because if I give you just two choices, I like to say that the only thing left in society with two choices is red or white wine, right? And you could have rosé, but rosé is kind of like the Green Party, you know, it's really small. Uh, and so, uh, and I think naturally then, what, what's evolved in this world where people, where I think naturally people want more choice. They're just not happy with limited choices. But, it, but it, that's where the paradox comes up, which is if I make you too happy, if I make you deliriously happy, you will not typically, not it's not true of everybody, but let's say 70, 80, 90% of people will just stick within their choice. And it, it's funny you should say natural and evolve or evolution or whatever you said, um, because in, in evolutionary theory, that's exactly what happens, that you have initially just one uh, choice or lineage, and then it explodes in all these forms, and then it coalesces on, on, on only a few, but then you have a few, and then these are not, then these become the one choice for those who went that way, so to speak. It's very similar. I'm just wondering if anybody has sort of attempted to model human choices in the same way. Uh, they have. I haven't done it. Okay. Somebody could take this work and actually do a pretty interesting paper mm -hmm. because I think you have a lot, you know, the, the data and information you have and drive down to how you, how either the phenomenon, be, the phenomenon that is so helpful becomes so destructive in and, of, in and of itself in certain environments. Look, it may not matter if, if you just order steak or sushi every day, who cares, right, necessarily. Of course, it could be damaging to your health or something, but, but by, so there are a lot of choices like this, but if the news, I think the news and political choices turn out to be particularly divisive when you apply the theory there. You want to get more people voting, but the question for me then is any technique you come up with seems to be open up the possibility of, well, one, people who are just voting based on the flipping a coin, which is not, that that's not necessarily helpful, and two, to vote by, how are you going to, how would, how do you, because anything that makes things less private makes it easy to do vote buying and other kinds of things. So how? You yeah, that, that's why I'm I'm concerned about that. I mean, look, uh, we shouldn't have voting on Tuesdays. They obviously should be. You know, look, I think they could be weekend long. Uh, I think if we really wanted to make it just, e we wanted to say let's update voting, or let's say if I gave you guys here an exercise and say forget how we vote now, design a system from the ground up to maximize privacy secret ballot, you know, ease of choice and understanding of the ballot and voting, you would design a system that looks fundamentally different from today's. And I think that's the exercise that we're, we're failing to take. We don't care about Tuesday voting, right? There's no reason that we keep anachronisms like that when we could, in fact, you know, design a new system, uh, and whether it's ATM or something else. But I, I do believe we, t we do easy fixes now, and we're not really starting from the ground up. Uh, so I have a prediction, and I was wondering if you agreed. Um, so a lot of the a lot of the trends you identified seem to be creating, um, you know, more choice. Seems to funnel people cocooning. Um, it seems like that would lead to less nationalism, less identity divided along country lines. And and one one example is more choice. You know, in the '90s, everyone watched Seinfeld. That was one thing everyone could you know, think I'm an American, we all watch Seinfeld. Before that, there were other shows. But now, there's no hits like on the scale of Seinfeld because there's so much more choice. People are cocooning more and know exactly what they want. Um, do you agree that more choice will lead to less nationalism and more of a global focus? Or maybe the identity lines will divide along something other than American, Russian, Chinese? Well, I talk about your specific example in the book which is I have a section on intelligent TV. And in fact, I use Seinfeld as the example. In the days of Seinfeld, and you were doing a TV show, to be successful, you, you would do jokes that 20% of the country would laugh at, right? Because you, the, your audience was so huge. Now, when the cost of making shows went down, and the number of channels went up, and so there are now 400 shows. So now, to be a hit show, I don't need 20%, I, I, 2%. Right? I can be a microtrend show. So now we can have intelligent shows, right? Breaking Bad, Homeland, et cetera. And we could have really horrible shows, <laughs> right? Really gritty shows, which if you ever spend time somewhere flipping the channels, you can't even believe. So you have this enormously expanded spectrum.
So that means over in Washington, when you used to say, hey, are you watching TV? People would all immediately say, no, I would never watch that you know, TV. Now they actually do because of that. So does that apply in the spectrum? <coughs> Uh, I'm, I don't know that that analogy applies to whether or not people will become, you know, more nationalistic or patriotic. To me, I look at the trends versus the counter trends. The more trends suck one way, what's the counter trend to that? So if there is a trend towards uh, reducing nationalism, being more international in nature, did it spark a counter trend of being more national? It looks like it did. It looks like, you know, <clears throat> when changes in values, you know, become too fast or too distant from a certain group. And remember, I didn't go through it as much, but the, but the, but, <laughs> sorry, but the, um, in fact, the country's never been older, and so the power has shifted from younger voters to older voters, right? And and so that power shift also underscores the cultural changes that millennials see then create a reaction in the older voters. So that's why I don't think it's necessarily the case because I think the trend, the battle of trend versus counter trend is more powerful than that. Okay? Uh, you threw in antitrust uh, coming back and, and uh, I think the final slide. How would you implement that and what would be the, the outcome you're looking for? Uh, I'd start with breaking up Google. No, just kidding, okay? Uh, the, uh, no, I, I think that I don't, you know, I don't have a full answer on that. I'm, I'm a little concerned that a lot of the tech companies uh, found the, uh, the, what I'd say, the, the area that they're really great at, and that then they stopped competing, uh, you know, in other areas, and then the other companies stopped competing. So I'm a little concerned that everybody is really doing incredibly well in their lane, but they're not facing at a certain point as much competition and that then that may slow down some of the innovation. And then I'm concerned on the advertising side that between Facebook and Google, it's a huge part of the advertising network. And the more uh, you know, Facebook can close off its network, the more actual power it has against advertisers, the opposite of what, of what people in Congress uh, realize. So I, I think we're gonna need some kind of task force to say, you know, I don't think we, look, I don't think the, as you can see from the questions of, of uh, you know, Zuckerberg, uh, not a lot of people in Congress are up to speed, right, to really kind of figure out what to do. I, I think we're going to need some kind of commission or task force to really study antitrust, privacy, AI, ethics, and come back with some serious recommendations. Because to now, frankly, we haven't had anything like that. Because Everything developed just so quickly that we got all the benefits first. And, you know, after all the benefits start to come a few problems. Not enough that I would halt the train, but enough that I would really have a national commission to come back with some thoughtful ideas on this. I was wondering if you could talk a little bit more about how a micro trend becomes something bigger and like a full national trend, for example. So um, to be more specific, so I'm a vegetarian, and I see that like there's clearly this micro trend happening of vegetarian and vegan options. Um, but then when I leave the city, for example, like it's much harder to get those. Um, so clearly, it's a micro trend. It's on the rise, but it's not everywhere. And like what, whether it's that um, example, like what are the obstacles that you have to break down to like make a micro trend into a huge? Well, you see, part of micro trends is you don't have to become big. The, the part of what's happened in the economics of, of being able, whether it's TV, Uber, it's a, part of what's happened in the economics is it's okay. We can provide affordable vegan food to you and provide affordable sushi for them and steak for them and chicken for them. And we didn't think we could do that in the past. So the economics enable microtrends to be successful at economic curves that are much lower than we ever imagined. Now, I actually did the vegan trend 10 years ago. <laughs> so, so luckily, I could say that I was ahead. And I, I think, actually, that's why I look at it in this book, and I say protein is the big trend I'd be looking at now, right? Vegan, 10 years ago, I would have been opening the, the vegan stands, although I think, you know, there's a tremendous kind of growth in particularly this kind of juice slash smoothie slash, but that's actually part of the trend that I have in fast eating. 
that people don't want to sit down and have an hour lunch. They're just as happy to have a bar or a drink or something and be done with it, right? And not go through the whole process of socialization, uh, which is different. So I, I don't know if you're going to get a full satisfaction microtrend in areas where your percentage dips really low. So you may want to live a little closer to some of, the, some of the areas where that's the case, because I think it's kind of leveled off. I actually don't think that it, there's enormous growth uh, in that right now. I think protein is the big grower. Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs>